Put your legs a little bit. There we go. You feel a little bit better. I got my C sharp hat on. We're gonna go into another segment here and start talking about and and building our application in just a few minutes. But how are you, chat room? Big thanks to the folks at Iron Software. I need to find my Iron Software hat to wear at some point today. We'll get there. You got to get a C-sharp hat like that, Cecil? I can make that happen. I know people that can make that happen. Um, our, our friend Fierce Kittens actually made some of these for me. So, yes. Uh, it, my gosh. She has a, a, a regular crafting sweatshop over there that she's able to generate all kinds of uh, em, embroidered things, bags. Um, um, now she's laser cutting. Really cool stuff over there. So, um, all right. We've gone through and we've done the basics. We've done the introduction. Here's what .NET MAUI is. <clears throat> Here's how it works with our applications and and how we get started what what's actually inside those templates we're now going to take that first step and and go off on our own and build and bring in features to write an application that will that will load and present news feeds from out there on the web so we're going to be starting and we're going to be diving in and i'm as I'm looking at how I laid out the content here, I'm, I'm kind of kicking myself because I, I set up for... I, I run into this all the time when I, when I design and build a workshop. And the first time I deliver a workshop, like I am today, I end up second-guessing some of the organization. And as I'm delivering and receiving questions and feedback from fine folks like you out there that are watching, it, it helps me decide how to reorganize things and get it laid out for better, better presentation in the future. So we're going to we're going to talk about layouts and and start binding that first list of initial newsfeed data out there and uh, see what that looks like. All right. So let me head back over to the code. Oh, nearly hit the wrong button. Don't do that. Don't hit the wrong button. There we go. So we're going to be going into this is called part 1. We're going to talk about layouts and binding data. See, look, I even put carriage returns in there and it formatted that funny. Um, I grabbed the layout diagram from the docs here so that you can see four of the common layouts that folks use when they're bu building MAUI applications. And it's best to think of, of these layouts, particularly when we're, when we're working and, and talking about our phones, right? Here, let me, don't hold up my phone. Hold up one of the dummy phones. One of the phones that, yeah, no power, but right, it's an it's an iPhone with. So when we when we think about our phones, there's four typical layouts that that folks use: a stack layout, where we're just going to have a stack of objects going going top to bottom. We can also stack things horizontally, and we can also stack things vertically this way, and weird things happen. We can have an absolute layout where we say, you know what, put this right here. All the time, it's going to go right here. Okay. We can have a grid, which is almost a throwback to the old table layout ways that we used to do things with HTML back in the day, back in the 90s, back in the dot-com era. Everything was grids, table, TRTD, right? You can do that. You can lay out a grid and force things to be in columns of certain widths and rows of certain heights. And we also have this flex layout, which is a way for us to just put stuff out there and it will fit it into the space, wrapping and placing things appropriately as it fits into that phone layout. Makes sense. Okay. We're going to prefer a stack layout for this because here's how, here's how we're going to build the application to look. All right. Once again, I'm showing you the basics here. And I'm calling it my news feeds because when we're done here, you can take this. Maybe you don't like purple. Maybe you want it to be blue. Maybe you want it to be red. Maybe maybe you've got a cool logo you want to put in there. Maybe you've got a different name for this. It's going to be up to you how you want to customize this. Tinker with it. Make it, make it work for you. All right? 
But I put three three blogs that we're going to load up and tinker with to start here. And uh, the .NET dev team blog, my blog, and the devto.net uh, hashtag and the collection of articles that are posted there. We're going to use these as our three, our three feeds to start here. So how do we get to there? This is clearly a stack layout. It's just a stack of entries. Each one of those is fully clickable, right? I want to be able to, to click anywhere on that row around the, the .NET dev blog and have it go and show me content from, from the Microsoft .NET blog. Or click anywhere in here and be able to see, well, here's what's, what's in Jeff's blog right now. So on and so forth. So it's a stack of content that we will wire up that ability to interact with and present. Now, this isn't going to be just a static list here. We're not going to hard code and everybody gets this and it's it and that's that. There is no way for you to get other feeds in here. We're just going to publish the .NET news, read, news reader and if other people have .NET news, well, too bad. You're not in our reader. Doesn't work. We're going to add the ability for folks to be able to add, add extra content in here. I won't add the remove button as part of this. I'll leave that as an exercise for you later. Narnia Expert asks, how would absolute layout work if Maui builds for devices of different screen sizes and resolutions? Good question. So there are ways to, to demand a specific size for your application. So you would demand a specific size and inside your application, we were showing up here that, hey, here's here's all the configuration stuff so you can decide how it's built, what it targets. The first line up here, I, I jumped right past it, is the target frameworks. And it specifies, here's the different operating systems that this is made available for. So if you want to force something to always appear in a specific layout, you clearly can't demand that layout on, on all the different Android devices, the different iOS devices between iPads, iPhones, and Android tablets for that matter. So really, you're going to want to narrow this down to .NET 7 Mac Catalyst, the Mac OS version, and the Windows versions as well. So that you can say, open a window of this size, it's always this size, right? That fixed window size that's always overlaying everything on your desktop, right? The, you've seen windows like this before in Windows and Mac. Then you can force and use absolute layout with some certainty at that point. But I would not use absolute layout when targeting the mobile devices. That just feels wrong. So, all right. Um... So let's start building this. I'm going to open the, the source code. I have a, a stripped down version of the source code. The complete application is sitting in the source folder, top level source folder of, uh, of the Maui workshop. So there's a doc and source folder here. This is the complete application inside source. Don't go there. That, that, that'll spoil the, the surprise when we get through there. Um, go into doc and we're going to start in, let's start in zero introduction because this is the content you would have at the end of, we're at the end of the introduction and I'm going to open that solution. And this is going to give us just some basic content to start here. Um, I'll start this for windows and you'll see that there's not a lot to see here. It's, it's not doing that much there. It's deploying and running on Windows. There we go. So my news feeds, and I just have a label here that says my news feeds. And it's just right there in the corner of the screen. Nothing to it, but nothing interesting yet, right? Th that title bar is the, the default operating system specific title bar that I get here on Windows. And there's a similar user interface uh, appearance on Android iOS and uh, Mac OS as well. So let's um, 
let's start going through and filling out a little bit of what we need here to get this started, to get this presenting and handling news feeds. So I talk about, let's put together a model to start here. All right. And our model, there's two models that we need. We need a list of feeds that we're going to present and work with. And we also need to be able to handle that RSS um, format. <clears throat> now, the, the RSS format, this is going to reroute over to the correct location for mine. There it is. Looks like this. And as a developer who's been working with a lot of web services recently, there's a really great tool that folks have written that allow you to take XML content and turn it into C-sharp classes, JavaScript classes, TypeScript classes. So I took this XML and, and tossed it, right? I just literally copied it, and I tossed it into the project and said paste special. There's a um, paste special option here. And I said paste XML as classes. And I generated an RSS type. Fantastic. I made it a partial class because I also put right next to it a serializer that knows how to read that XML and turn it back into my RSS type. That's great. If I was building to work with other web services, what an easy way to go and, and generate that, that strongly typed content that I'm going to be retrieving from these different places. There's just one small problem. I'm going to continue developing and working with this and show you because that's, that, that's where I have the model working, where I have the demo working. But the problem is um, there is a syndication feed object. It doesn't come as part of um, some of the base class libraries. It is a package out there that you can get and work with um, for .NET. You can grab that. It has fantastic abstraction <clears throat> over all the features of RSS. Absolutely should be using that. It's one of these things where you got to the end of your project and looked back and said, oh, that would have been a lot easier. So I've already got the code written <laughs> to do it with this RSS type. Um, if you're looking back watching this recording, this note might not be here and we might be using the syndication feed objects directly. Um, and that's okay. That's, that's going to give you a little bit more durable, standard way to interact with your code. But the lesson here also is if you're interacting with some web service that, that you, you're going to be receiving a standard format of content coming back, whether it's XML format or JSON format. This technique works great. Works great for that. Okay? So I have my RSS feed that may be replaced at some point with syndication feed, but I have my RSS type sitting here that I can work with. Remember, partial classes give us a way to say, well, this is generated code. I'm going to mark it with partial here. And I'm, I'm going to connect into it. I'm going to jam into that object additional methods, features, and capabilities by putting another file somewhere with a class that has the same name, RSS, but I'll label it partial, and it'll put that content into the same class. Kind of makes sense. That's, that's pretty cool. That gives me a way to have handwritten code work with generated code, and we can do cool things then. And you're going to see a lot more of that as we go through the application here. All right. So partial classes. There's also partial methods that we're going to engage and use later as well. So I have my RSS. I also need a way to define, well, what's this news feed that I'm tracking? And that's really just the a title and, and the URL that I'm fetching that content from. That's, that's very simple. Do I really need a whole class for that? 
I'm going to create this with a record. Now, a record is a new keyword. It's a new object type that's available to us as of .NET 6. That it, It's a C-sharp feature that allows you to specify in one line of code Here's an object. It's a reference. It's a reference type object. So that means it's going to behave and, and go on the heap in memory, not on the stack. And I can create and work with it with just a literally a, what looks like a constructor. I end up with these two properties made available through a little bit of code generation that happens behind the scenes thanks to the compiler. So I'll end up with a source URL property and a title property for that news feed. Now, for some of the other interactions that I'm going to have throughout the application, I'm going to add an additional constructor here that allows us to create a news feed and not pass in any arguments. And it'll create a news feed with empty strings for the URL and the title. All right. So I have a newsfeed object. I have an RSS object that I can work with now to construct and read content from somewhere out on, out on the web. We don't know quite where. That Fritz guy's blog looks, looks good and some of these other blogs. But there's more we're going to build and interact with. So let's take that newsfeed and let's put together some sample data that will display and bind in a collection view on that main page. So first thing we need to do is we need to teach the main page XAML about our models folder that we're going to grab our news feed out of. So we add a namespace to main page XAML. I'm going to call it model. You can call this whatever you'd like, but we're teaching it about the my news reader models folder. Okay. So it now knows what these three things are and we can work with them. All right. I'm going to get rid of this label and we're going to introduce a collection view. There's a lot going on here. Let's copy this and bring it in and talk about this. A collection view is a way for us to display a collection of data. So we're, we're going to take this content, we're going to bind it, right? That means we're going to repeat whatever's inside this template right here for each item in the collection that we're connecting it to. That makes sense. So we're going to specify an item source in our markup here so that we've got this sitting here it's easy for us to tinker with experiment with before we go and introduce any kind of complex architecture we're just going to tinker with this for the purpose of viewing and seeing what it looks like so i've created an array and there are news feed objects each one of these types is a news feed and we specify them by saying model there we're referencing that namespace this is standard xml model and we're it's of type newsfeed and there's our two properties title and source url so the net dev blog and there's the url for that jeff's blog and there's the url devto.net tag and there's the url for that and you can find these feeds searching looking online sometimes there's that little rss orange um what looks like an orange uh radio signal button um on web pages if you do a view source and you do a find for RSS or feed, you'll see a link in the source code for those. So I went and grabbed these, these few and, and we'll lob them into this array. Our template, the content we're going to repeat again and again. Um, no, not, how did that get? Uh, no. I've, I've got some things duplicated here. Yeah, we're good. Did that stuff end up duplicated there? It did. 
That's not supposed to be there. Better. All right. Cool. So we have a template and inside we have a data template defined here that's going to receive a news feed type, right? We have to specify the type that we're binding with. And let's, let's put a label here. We're gonna specify the text color is gray. We're gonna center this vertically inside of here. And the text we're going to place, we're gonna bind two values to this. And we're gonna put a pipe in the middle here. So the title will go to the left of the pipe. The source URL will go to the right of the pipe. And that's a path Right, that's the navigation path off of this news feed. Let's see what that looks like. And deployed. And there's our initial series of feeds. Now, it doesn't look very compelling. The font color could use some work there. But, and, and it's also a little bit tiny. It's a little bit tiny. So we can improve that a little bit with some styling. We can move things around. And quite frankly, it's, it, quite frankly, it's nicer to stack these values. And that's where I had my user interface defined originally. So let's, let's update that and make this look a little bit nicer. BizCAD with a really good question there. Let me bring that up, and I'll also grab MCW Young's question. Could you use a dollar in string format? Uh, no. Um, the, the binding there isn't, it isn't using that string interpolation. This is its own binding syntax, where it is more like a string format to output here, but you're just specifying here's the locations of where these things are landing. Um, what I have seen folks do is add additional properties onto this object that contain the formatting to output here and just apply that formatting that they want to output. Um, MCW Young asks, how do you download the initial code from zero introduction? Um, several ways to do it. If you're following along, this is in a GitHub repository. So if you go all the way up to the top of of the repository click the green button here you can download the zip it's hiding behind your question you can download the zip file right there and you can pluck out just that folder from the zip file and work with it so thank you for the question appreciate it um all right Close that screen. Good. So, um, jump back through. <laughs> nope, I was in the wrong one. There we go. All right. So, we can rearrange that label by just nesting another vertical stack layout. And this is something that, as a web developer, felt weird at first but now I get it. We're specifying the text property for the label here. We can replace that with our own template, our own description here that says, well, I want a vertical stack layout in there. I'm gonna put a little bit of padding between them and we're gonna bind the title to a label that'll appear first. And we're not gonna put, put it that way. Let's get, get it like this. So we'll put a vertical stack layout inside the template, not just one label, but a layout inside the template. And I'll specify a font size here and I'll specify a font size here. I believe I can also specify a text color and let's make that black. And let's make this uh, gray. 
And now we've just moved things around a little bit. And we're very clearly now binding these elements from the newsfeed object to those labels. And it lines up and it formats nicely. And we've got, we've got something we can work with here, right? I could also make this bold. Right, um, there it is. Bold font attributes, bold, and yeah, I, it it doesn't hot reload right now, but we'll refresh that. That's very off topic, Cyrus. A security type product, no. Um, so there we go. So now it's bold. It's got that little gray element underneath of it, so you can see. Here's the URL for that feed. Cool. I have an initial layout here. It also works great over in Android when we start up and getting that running. And I have this very simple layout that's just that collection view with a vertical stack of each of the elements that are inside that. Okay. And I've got this hard-coded over here. We're going to move these out and make this a little bit easier to work with. With a little bit of uh, MVVM. So that's building. We'll get it deployed over here to the Android app. And, and we'll see our initial application loading, running with that content. Waiting. Come on. Did, did I just not hit the thing? I thought I hit the thing. I, I don't think I hit the build. Ah, darn it. So there it goes. Build started. And in just a few minutes. Not a few minutes, but in just a few seconds. It should be deployed and running over there. First time building this application, so it takes a little bit of time to lay out the content on disk. So, um, but this this initial very simple binding gets us out the door, gets us to a nice layout without having to think too much <clears throat> about how to position, how to how to connect and write content into these fields the this binding technology right something very standard very easy to work with there it goes found the device it's going to get sent over there remaining items and remaining items reached threshold is fun on collection view i bet oh yes so there we go with the font sizes that i chose there they are on screen and i can do the little stretch so maybe there's other content, more information we want that to do in the future. Okay, so we're, we've displayed our first set of items here. We need to start introducing a little bit more to go with this. How do I get that data? How do I present, navigate, and show here's what's actually on these pages, right? So we're going to step through and, and go to more of that. We've gone through just the basics of data binding here. This was a very, very quick module to get into some of that XAML layout and, and what we're going to accomplish here. There's going to be a lot more that we're going to cross in, in the next few modules here. All right. Now, if I remember correctly, uh, that's... I don't think I have a... a yeah, I didn't go through and start working on the save data locally yet. But I do have the content. I do have the demo working. So we're going to show and work with a little bit of that. So these are hard-coded here. And I don't want them hard-coded. I want to have a service object that's going to manage some collection of them that's specific to you and is saved and stored on your device so that you can go back through, read them, interact with them, whatever. So 
there's a couple things there that we need to do and figure out and and build, quite frankly. There's libraries that will help us do this. But we we clearly need some sort of a add new add new feed button and a refresh feeds button. So let's do that. Let's let's add two buttons that'll be anchored down here at the bottom and we'll have those click through to some sort of a add new feed feature that will retrieve data from a service and present it on this screen. We'll, we'll move away from having that data being loaded and presented using, um, using that array that's hard coded there. So let's move in that direction now. All right. Yep. Save the state. That's fine. I'm, I'm going to stay primarily on the windows emulator here. So let me open that. So I have my notes in front of me. There we go. All right. Because at this point, we're going off the rails, friends. So I have this main page and it's sitting here in this views folder. And we're gonna create and we're gonna work with a series of different views here. It, the ability to add news feeds, the, the actual content of the feed, and the content of the specific article from the feed that we're going to present and interact with. So, can I program drag to refresh if device features like that are built into Maui? Yes, you can. Um, there's an event handler for that and you can have it trigger and call a, call a method, call an event handler that goes and does that. We're going to pivot and use a little MVVM, model view, view model, to make this easier for us, to make generating and working with that content easier. So I, I want to have this view for add news feed and I want to have a service up here that for right now I've I've got it coded just coded here as a list that we could tinker with and bind to and that'd be nice and I think we actually want to probably jump right into saving this to disk so um, and now you've got me wondering about the right the right um, there is a pull to refresh I forget what object is that a uh, a gesture recognizer on this. Gestures, there's the tap that we'll be doing. Um, no, it's not in the list. There's a way, to, I don't have that sample ready, I, and it's not something I've hit yet. But uh, I will add the pull to refresh uh, demo. I will add that into the docs here when we're through later. For displaying data, it seems like the last four lines are closing. Yes, I just updated that refresh. It, it was an error. There was a copy paste that didn't land properly in the code Narnia expert. Go ahead and refresh and clear that out. So I don't have docs for the for most of the rest of the modules here. We're going to be going through these by hand and, and doing this. And we'll, uh, we'll get final documents written, produced, and out there for folks after. So first thing I want to do is I have this news feed service that I initially was using with a dictionary up here. But I want to actually have this read and write to disk. But this service, I want to be available so that I can fetch and interact with my data and also go get the news feed, the RSS data, to present on screen. I want to put that all in this one place so that I have one piece of business logic that knows how to interact with those. I do that by introducing, and I'm going to inject 
an object that knows how to work with that. And I'm going to create just one of these because I'm only ever... Oh, uh, look, I've already got it loaded in there. Fantastic. I'm only ever going to need one of these at a time. You can't have multiple people interacting and possibly hitting some sort of memory leak situation. Only one person uses an app at a time when it's running natively like this. So, I've got a singleton that we're going to define here for the news feed service. Whenever we need a news feed, a, a news feed service, some way to interact with either the content on disk or getting data out there, if it's requested, pass this object through. Uh, let me catch up. There's a, I see a question or two coming in there. Marshall BRA, thank you so much for the subscription. And we'll make a donation to our Raspberry Pi classroom for the kids at St. Jude. Thank you so much for your support. The namespace in XAML view. There's a question here from, uh, it's Brunha. Let's bring that up. Right, there we go. That namespace on the XAML view over here. Um, it's related with data in the collection view, binding them on the label. Do we still need that namespace? Yes. This is how XAML knows how to connect from how to connect and interact with our CLR content, our .NET content that's written, so that it knows that this is .NET content we're placing here from this application. Um, Narnia expert when tried to build trying to build gets an error on made page on the line of the first selection mode equals none. The property content is set more than once. Um, the property content is set more than once. Check to make sure that this is all that you have on the screen. I have a feeling that you have either a, a second collection view or you have multiple templates or something here. Yeah, you can only have one thing in the page content. Somewhere you've got an extra element there. Can I show the foreground process or do a video about that? What do you mean by the foreground process? I want to make sure I understand what you're asking about. Um, so I've defined a service that's going to be able to process, go get and work with data. It's over here. Yes, the the data type here defines, right? There's also a type here that defines what type these things are that we're working with. Put a layout in there like a vertical stack layout and then just put all your other stuff inside of it. Exactly. Yep. Processes that runs at background during the app to sync data, for example, without user interaction. I'm not building a background, um, any kind of background processing in this. This is going to be all um, foreground processing. So background processing is absolutely something to be considered. We're not going to get there in, in this demo. Um, I am going to quit that. I think I'm seeing let me see yeah okay okay just catching up um, the URL for the workshop is tacking on the at the end Oh, shoot. On the stream elements tag. Um, sure, let's fix that. Um, not that one. Oh, even though it's on separate lines, it's consolidating that. Hmm. Let's 
see if we do that. That should help. Let me fix the other command. Yeah, that one's good. So, thanks for picking that up and, and highlighting that. Appreciate it. All right. Um, so, I'm going to define this service. I don't want to use that item source. So let's get rid of that. And we're going to somehow load that service into here and start working with it. And this is where MVVM is going to help us. We're going to create a view model <clears throat> that's going to expose the interactions with that service and make available all the things we need to format this page. I have already included a package for working with MVVM and it is, where's my packages? There we go, Community Toolkit MVVM right there. So this is the Community Toolkit, the .NET Community Toolkit. It's got all kinds of little tools in there, little shortcuts, shims, features that are gonna make it easy for you easier for you to build your applications and adhere to some common software design patterns. In particular, we're using the MVVM segment of this so that it will generate some code and allow us a, allow some of the plumbing of the application, wiring up events, allow it to standardize, use a command pattern that will wire up and and give us, quite frankly, a nice way to raise events and notify other parts of the application when stuff has occurred. So with this available, I can create a view model and I'm going to define a base view model object over here as a partial class that's going to contain things that every page needs, like the title of the page, like the um, whether or not the page is busy rendering and doing something so I can display an activity indicator, right? Some sort of progress bar or a spinner. And I need to let it know stuff's going on that you, you should know about. You should behave and show properly that things you, you want to present and hide or notify the, the users that stuff's happening and we're working over here or that common formatting we need on every page. So we're going to start off by labeling this as an observable object. This means that it's going to start to generate some of those on property notify changed fields, right? And events so that as some of our properties are updated, we'll be able to work with those. We'll be able to, to track and interact and present that content, right? And that's going to come in important when we add new fields here. <gasps> no, that's not what we're putting in there. Thank you, GitHub Copilot, but not quite. I'm going to start with an is busy indicator. And this is busy indicator is going to be an observable property. What does this do? This is going to tell, this is going to give us a way to tell the user interface there's something processing behind the scenes here. Put up that indicator. And when it's done, send a notification that that's changed so the indicator can come off screen. Now, this is using the MVVM toolkit. Look at that. Whole bunch of syntax help there. But what I want you to see is it generates some code for us um, up here. Let's jump into, I'll jump into the Windows version. Under Analyzers, there's things in here that are generating code for us. Um, right? It's not under package. No, no, no. It's one of these. Let's tell it to build that to start with. And what this will do is we're going to see 
yeah, here, source generators. There's some error message handlers, but here we have source generators. And here's this observable property generator. And it's generated a file for us here, basemodel.g.cs. Look what it's generating for us so we can communicate with the rest of our project. All right. Got a couple extra browser windows open here that we need to keep an eye on. This code gen stuff is very cool. So typically when you would be building and working with a class and you need to notify the rest of the application, hey, stuff's happening, you would, for that property, you would just have a get that says, ah, return the value. But when we set the value, we wanna notify, well, the value's changing. Generically, the property's changing and we need to notify other places. I don't know who it is, but we're gonna raise an event and send that information that this property is changing. We're actually gonna set the value. And after we're done setting the value, we're gonna go back and notify everybody again. Okay, value's changed. And that then becomes something that can help us update our user interface to work with it. So here's those events that we can implement. These are event handlers that we can implement. See, they're partials. If we apply and we provide additional signature to it, we can implement that and do something additional over there. Ah, you hadn't deleted the label above the first collection view. There you go. The, the initial label that I put in there, I deleted that when I pasted in the content. There you go. Glad to hear it, Narnia expert. So all of this is generated for us for every property, for not even property, for fields that we put out here and we decorate with observable property. To note, this is Pascal case and it will generate camel case. No, this is camel case and it'll generate Pascal case, right? The initial capitalization version of this so that you have that same version out there. Also note, this is a private scope field and it generates the public scope version for us with the case change in the property names. Great. Um, yes, you can, there's other naming tricks you can do in there and it'll create those as well. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. I do like the underscores for my inner fields, but so we have is busy. I also want to add a title that we're going to assign to pages and I'll make that an observable property also because, well, when we get to the, the page that says, here's the content of this news feed, I want to set the title here and have it picked up and displayed on that page. I don't want to have to reach into some object and figure out what it is, set the value here that we want to put on the page. Makes sense, okay. I can also put a, and and we did this in the, uh, in the, the monkey demo. I can also put a, a value here called is not busy, and I can just return the inverse of is busy. Now, there is an additional parameter you can put on here so that when is busy changes, I can say, well, also notify is not busy. Now, for this application, I don't need the is not busy feature. I can work with this and that'll work just fine. All right. So I've got two little properties that I want to be available in every view model so that we can load and work with that data. Next steps. I'm gonna create a view model for the page that's, ooh, look at all that stuff. See all that goo that's being built and maintained for you? Gosh. I'm going to, going to create a news feed view list, a news feed list view model right? This is that main page. This is the content for this. I could probably call this main page view model. 
but this is going to inherit from that base view model. We're, this is the home page. This is where you log in, and we're going to go and show you the content for the news feeds that are currently registered. Um, this is Cascadia code that I'm using. So, I want to load up that newsfeed service, the the class that, that we're going to have over here that's going to know how to load and interact with these. For the purposes of showing news feeds on the screen, I'm going to need access to that. So in my view model here, I will cr I'll create a constructor and I want a news feed service that we'll interact with and I'll control dot there and create a field, a read-only field for that service. So we store a reference to it, so I know how to interact with it and and get that data, right? I have, I have a jump-in point here where I can fetch that data, right? I don't like that, uh, whatever. So, what next? Well, when you first navigate when you first navigate to the page and we're presenting this content, not only do I want to grab that service, but the first thing I need to do is I, I need to get the feeds, right? So let's get the feeds that we want to present on screen. And I'll just generate a method for that down here. And I'm going to make that an async task because it might take some time to load that from disk. All right. Let's get a, let's figure out how exactly this works and we'll fill in some of the logic after this. Um, if the page is busy, don't do anything, just return. We don't need to go figure out other things. Let's put a little bit of a try catch here. So first thing we want to do is we want to set that, oh, look at this. GitHub Copilot, sometimes you're too good to me. Set is busy, true. We need some collection of feeds that we're going to present on screen. We're going to want some, some collection of feeds that we're going to present. So, and, and, Let's be clear. Let's call that news feeds. Okay. Um, and I probably don't want to clear that until after I get the content. Um, and after we get that, add each feed that we get out of our service, add that onto the news feeds. That kind of makes sense. Copilot is coming through with the big alley-oop there, right? Generated a lot of code that just makes this work for us nicely. And nice. Finally, no matter what, turn off the is busy indicator. Let's make sure we also put a catch in here for the exception handling. Right? Let's be a good, a good developer citizen here. Um, I'll debug right line. Unable to get the news feeds. And we'll just write out the message to the debug console. Let's also put a message on screen. We can do that using the shell. So give me the current application shell. And let's display an alert. And uh, yeah, error while fetching news feeds. Right? Um, that's going to be our title. The actual content we'll display is that, and we'll put an OK button on the end. So that's how you display alerts. So display alert, title, and the content along with buttons you put at the bottom. Um, all right. Now we need to figure out how to work with these. Well, news feeds, let's create, create that as, um, we're gonna create that as a field. It's not an object. 
Um, and quite frankly, let's move it down here because we want it to generate some stuff for us. Um, there's a new type that we're going to use for this, not just a list or, or an array or a dictionary, but we're going to use an observable collection so that we get notified when this content is changed. And this will be an observable, an observable collection of news feeds. I'm going to set this up with a public, this should be public, I made it private, with a public get without specifying the set means it's it's read only effectively. Thank you, Copilot. And it's going to generate and put a collection in there by default. And it's a collection of type observable collection by using the new um, the, the new keyword there. That clears out these couple er a couple of errors, but we still need get feeds async. Before I do that, let me go back to chat. Let me catch up on some of the questions over there that I see coming in. Um, what kind of mobile app are we building? Asks Ray. Um, we're building an RSS reader. Thank you so much for the cheer. We'll donate th those bits to our Raspberry Pi computer classroom that we're building for the kids at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Thank you so much, Ray. Um, sax guy with dogs. That, it, you like the saxophone and you, you, you've, got, you've got some canines. Fantastic. Coding style design question. That's a good question to talk about. Let me, let me grab that and bring this into the mix here. Um, I thought using interfaces for some of these injection points was a best practice. Easy to mock for unit tests and the like. You're right. They are. Um, and for the purposes of a .NET MAUI application, we want to keep the, the amount of code bloat down. So um, because these aren't sealed classes... We we can implement and we can bring in um, we can bring in fakes and stubs and still work with work with them for testing, um, but this does still give us that level of separation. But for a Maui app where every byte matters that we ship onto a mobile phone, it's better not to bring interfaces into the mix and consider multiple implementations. You might have a different implementation that you register and bring in, um, but bring that in from another namespace and you end up um, doing something a little bit different. You, you, you may break some things, but we do want to keep these a little bit more closely coupled, more tightly coupled for this. All right. So let's talk about this get feeds async. Let's let's talk about this thing right here. Um, we want to get feeds asynchronously from our service. So I'm going to just control dot on there and generate that method. I don't know what it's going to do just yet. But we're going to figure this part out now. So we have a way to get the feeds and, and put them into our view model here so they can be read. Hey, Swifty Spiffy, hello. It didn't recognize the hat, did it? Um, how are you, my friend? Welcome. Um, Space Shot with the resub, 44 months with us. Much appreciate. Try that hat one more time. Nope, didn't pick it up. Hmm. I'll even look down a little bit further. No, I, I have moved and I'm using a different camera. I'm not sure why it's not finding it, but it should have found it. Um, VAR, oh yeah, we, VAR is amazing, right? So, we have a way to, to get those feeds. We're exposing them from our view model so that we can paint them on screen. We'll talk about how we paint that on screen in a little bit, but let's put together a way to get those feeds. So over here in newsfeed service, um, this is an internal task. Well, I mean, gosh, let's make this 
Let's make this public. Um, I could make this an async task. Um, and let's have this return an IE numerable of type newsfeed, right? And I have this collection of them up here. I, I could very easily, right? Yes, you're you're telling me nothing returns a value. Yeah, I know. I could very easily just say return feeds keys. And it'll return for me those feeds. I'm also capturing and I'm going to stash the RSS next to these if I wanted. So that I'm running this th this this resource in memory, right? This service. Just run it in memory and return that content when I call get feeds async, right? And this should probably be uh, uh, from result, right? There we go. And I'll get rid of the async. Um, ba -ba -ba. Oh, fine. Tell you what. I don't even need... Yeah, there we go. So, I'm returning that content, and this is now satisfied. It knows how to return those, and I've got my little collection up there that I can use to, to um, present on the on the XAML. We're gonna we're gonna run into a couple of uh, brain breaks there as we go through this. Var is bad practice. Completely disagree. Completely disagree. Yes, I I know I know it is Bizcat. Yep, it could. I'll change that. Not a problem. Let's let's rename. That was the name that it generated for us uh, from Copilot. So <clears throat> you like about target types new? They had to give it a name, but um, you don't like var because it's not immediately clear by looking at the code what the type is. That's fair. However, when I look at this, I have a pretty good idea that it's returning something is of type feed in this case. Like, that kind of makes sense. Um, and, and I would look at that also as, look at using var there as, if you don't know what type is coming out of the method that you're assigning, you're you're not um, you're not naming your method in a in a descriptive way, right? Um, right. If I did something like that, very explicit, very clear. That's what that is. So, I'm okay with that. It's a question of where you like to read the content. And as somebody who was a former VB6 developer and a VBA developer back in the day, I'm okay with the VAR keyword. Lots of folks in web development, they're used to the VAR keyword, let keyword, these types of things. Questions here coming in. Ray, uh, Ray asks, wouldn't you have to update get feeds async since I changed the name? Um, I didn't, I didn't change the feeds async in my service. Um, I, I just changed the name here inside of, um, inside of my view model. If there are multiple levels of inheritance, there's ambiguity. No, you created a new car. If you want to force it to a different type, then you need to be explicit with your type. So, um, VB.net with VB2008. Well, there you go. Yeah. Um, nah, don't worry about that. Oh my gosh, Ray, thank you for the cheer. Um, so for those of you that haven't seen, that don't know, we are, all of our cheers, all of our subscriptions, we are working with the Raspberry Pi Foundation to, to purchase um, a, a set of Raspberry Pi 400 devices and training materials that we're putting together 
for the school and the kids at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital so that they can get the opportunity to learn about technology, to learn about programming, just like we are when they might have a, a long visit to, to the hospital. They want to learn about games. They want to learn about websites. They'll be able to do that with the Raspberry Pi tools and books and materials that we're putting together for them. Thank you so much for that support, Ray. All right. This is where it, some of the discussion there, and, and I'm going to leave that so I can focus on the, the workshop here. Some of that discussion is, is the pivot point where software goes from engineering to art form. And everybody codes a little bit differently. There is no wrong way. There is, everybody thinks it's wrong because it's not the way they code. <laughs> I don't like the way that's written because that's not the way I code. Uh, I like my curly braces down on this line. I've got people that were really upset at me that I put a space here. And they want it up like that. Give me a break. Gives a little bit more breathing room. And when you when you get into your 40s and 50s and, and the, the senior developers, and by senior I mean folks with a little bit more colorful facial hair, or just hair hair for that matter, um, look at that and go, ah, can't quite see that code. A little bit more difficult to read there. So let's go through this. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, so I have a way to get the data and I'm stashing it in here, but this get feeds method here, I'm probably going to want to call that from other places later on because I, I'm going to want to be able to refresh and come back to this. In MVVM, we create commands that do that. And we can create a command, we can generate a command object to go around this by using the relay command attribute. Look at, look at that uh, uh, syntax help there, love it. Check this out. Relay command creates Another bit of code generated for you. We'll go up here into the source generator. There's the relay command, and there you can see, here's the code it generated for us. So we're going to create, let me zoom out just a little bit so you can see more there. So we're going to create an async relay command called get feeds command. And we're going to wire that up with a property that's either going to pull out the value that's assigned or create an async relay command that calls asynchronously the get feeds method that we wrote. Okay, so now we have this command that we can call over in our user interface to interact with and execute this method. So we aren't explicitly calling this method. It's being handed off by a command, right? And commands are things that we can connect and, and wire directly up to our XAML so that it renders and presents the content. This makes it a workshop. People can write in it with their own style. Totally. Totally. And right, this discussion is what makes the, the experience of watching the live workshop much more valuable. Absolutely. So, but those of you that are watching on the recording out there, uh, you can zip and fast forward and even watch it double time and listen to me with a, with a really high voice. No echo, though. So on and so forth. Okay, so I have my command now to get feeds. And we can put a button on the screen to kind of force this to happen if we ever need to refresh. But let's wire up our view model here. Uh, I don't know if it's going to get it. Yeah, I don't know why it's not finding. What is it? Is it because my... Is it... Nope, still didn't get it. Not quite sure. Last time, and then we'll move on. Nope. Um... So I have this view model. I need to wire it up to my main page so that this page knows it has to work with the view model. 
to get the data, to interact, and also to hand off the event processing through those commands. So we've got the view model, right? The that's and the view model contains here's the properties and the methods and the event handling for the view. The view is our XAML, and our model is uh, our news feed object that we're presenting on screen. Okay, so let's let's stitch this last piece together. We've we've got our view model talking to our service that gets out our models. And I always, when I think of MVVM or MVC, there's always an R in there that that folks omit. There's always a repository in there where you're working with data somewhere. It might be on disk. It might be across the network. It, it might be in a database somewhere on the other side of the network. We don't know. But there's a repository you're working with, and you're doing something with that repository. In this case, we're going to have a, a service that is both going to right, fetch the web content for those feeds and interact with my preferred feeds that are saved to disk. So let's, let's do this wire up between the view model and the view. All right, so on the main page, we need to do a couple things here. First thing, we're going to go back over to main page. I'm going to hit the F7 key, it jumps me right into the code behind. And I've actually already got it written up here. We've enhanced, we've updated the constructor here so that it receives that view model. And we're going to wire it up to the binding context for the page. So this is the binding context is the object that contains the properties that'll be targeted by the bound properties of the XAML. So when we say, right, when we say binding, instead of it going and working with this page, it's going to work with the contents of this thing. There's my generated code. There it is right there. Okay. So... I, that makes sense. We're redirecting. Here's where you should be working, right? So that we've got our logic someplace that isn't directly tied into the XAML. In the XAML, though, we need to start providing the markup so that it knows, hey, you're not working with, you're not working with the main page XAML CS class, but instead you're working over here with my newsfeed list view model. So I've already got the model in there so it knows how to go and, and work with the, um, the newsfeed object. So let's add a similar namespace, this time reaching into the view models folder where this is living, okay? So now it knows what a view model is. I'm also going to add an entry here called uh, x data type equals, and we're going to specify the data type that we're working with on this page is, look at this, it's auto-completing for me. I'm not writing code, I'm just tab space, tab space, tab space, uh, like a coding monkey just coming through and, and slapping the keyboard and generating an application here. So there's my data type. Now, I can, I'm specifying my title here, I've got it hard-coded to my news feeds. I can bind that if I want to. And it will know. Why didn't it see that? It should get that. Newsfeed list view model. Newsfeed list view model. Inheritance from base view model, which is over there, and it's got title. Yeah. Um when this page starts, let's set the title oh you're you're killing me smalls now why isn't it seeing the title fritz's news just fritz's news let's do that there we go so we're starting to bind and push this content from here into those properties 
and it's being picked up and it'll be displayed there. Okay. We had that item source as a collection embedded in the markup here. I want to pull that item source now from the news feeds that, that we've got exposed as a property right here. So let's do that. So in my collection view, I'm going to add, right? Uh, yeah, items source, there we go. And I'm gonna bind that. I'm binding it to, uh, what did we call it there? News feeds, thank you. Copilot beat me to it, man. So what have we done? We've redirected where this is getting data. So it's going over to our view model. Our view model is receiving a service object. And as soon as it starts, it's going and getting from that service. Get me the feeds that you know about and stash them in this news feed collection that we've exposed as an observable collection, a property that we're going to display and work with. Now, it's a collection of these and we're it, it knows how to raise those on property notify changed and things like that. If it was a value type or a complex type, not an observable object type like this, we'd want to wrap that observable property on these, put decorate it with that observable property. But here, because it is an observable object already, we'll just leave this here and we'll be able to load and present that content. We need to make sure that all those objects are preserved for us so that it knows how to create them. I've already got them configured over here inside Maui program for dependency injection. So it knows how to find that list view model, the news list, news feed list view model. That's it. Can I buy a noun? Um, and then the main page, it knows how to create that. Okay. All right. Let's, did, did I get this right? Let's try and run it. Hold on to your butts. Darn Skippy. Did I get all the things right? So building, this is gonna run on Windows. There we go. There's the four feeds that we, that we defined. They were hard coded into that list, but they're loaded, they're bound, and they're displayed here. The title that we set, Fritz's News, is displayed up at the top there, all being managed and coming out of the view model. We've now made the view dumb. I, I have no shame in saying that. There is no logic in the view other than I know how to make the things in the view model look pretty. I know how to make it appear nice and look good on that screen. All right. That's cool. That's, that's a big step to binding data, working with view model objects, bringing a service in that's going to manage that data. It's managing it in memory now, but we can save that to disk and we're going to bring that part in next. Let me take a look over here at chat. Junior, Junior Felix, how you doing there, Junior Felix, with a question here. Can we include MVVM to Blazor? No, the, the community toolkit MVVM doesn't work with Blazor. Um, and a lot of what Blazor does is very MVVM-ish. Um, not, it's, it's not quite all the features that you're seeing here, but the, the user interface in Blazor, as you update the properties that are exposed in a Blazor pages class, automatically update, automatically receive that notification and refresh for you. Um, I, I'm saying that now, and then there's, of course, a caveat in that. Unless you're doing something off cycle from handling an event, there was a timer, there was a callback or something, and that isn't automatically reevaluating properties and repainting the screen. You have to call state as changed, but you're, it's pretty close to MVVM. It's not a perfect MVVM implementation. Folks are trying to squeeze it in there. 
I think it's a little bit of overkill, personally. Hey, Darren. Darren Evans with a question here. As much as I dig VS Code, the awesome tooling in Visual Studio when working in the .NET world is so nice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darren. Um, yeah, there's there's definitely things to be said about leveling up to Visual Studio from Visual Studio Code. Um, definitely additional features. A lot of a lot of features, tools, resources that have been built over many many years. Consequently, then there's also a little bit of baggage that comes with it. Versus VS Code, where you can kind of opt in to just the features that you want. That's nice. Um, but the level up to this level of features in a full IDE, not just a text editor, is pretty cool stuff. So, thank you, Darren. Appreciate you chiming in there. Junior Felix says, I think we can replace this with state management. <coughs> we can. I'm not going to as part of this. We can. I want to get through and show some of these other basic concepts to integrate, but some of that architecture stuff, you're absolutely right. Um, is it is it here in Wolf or is it is it Harry and Wolf? Oh, I want to make sure I pronounce your your screen name there properly. Asking, are we going to work on some kind of authentication authorization? Not as part of today's he, uh, Harry and Wolf. Okay, um, I'll remember that. Not as part of today's workshop, um, but definitely something that we can consider for a video in the future. Thinking out loud, we work on a, a project, a website here on a channel called Clip Talk, K-L-I-P-T-O-K.com, that makes Twitch clips discoverable. Um, that uh, uh, website, we, we're very much in the process of building a mobile app for well, for, for that mobile app, you're going to need to be able to log in with your Twitch account so we can get your followers and, and information. So that is coming at some point. I'm not including it in, in part of today's. T today is very much a basics. Um, so will I be showing multiple pages with navigation? Asks Hop in the Cloud. Yes. Because, right, the, the next piece we got to do here is... Is well, darn it! I don't want to see Fritz's list of feeds here. I want to put something else on there. I, I want to put NPR on there. I want to put. I, I like CNN. No, I like Fox News. I I, I want to put uh, the BBC news feed on there. Whatever it might be, that's that's up to you. We want to be able to navigate then to some sort of an ad page, ad feed page, where we can add entries to this. And we want to be able to navigate when we click on one of these to a page that says, here's the articles from Rolling Stone or from Jeff's blog. The, 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 the dare I say, greatest blog on the internet. I can't back that up. I don't write on that blog that frequently. But yes, we're going to be showing multiple pages. That's coming up. All right. Um, I, Tokyo Rack, I, I've, I've got to brag when I can. Right. <laughs> um, okay. We've got the initial bits of the news feed. We've got it connected up. Next, The next thing we want to talk about is building that service. Building that out so it saves locally. And when we think about saving things locally, we're going to use SQLite. That's a fantastic little database, little file size database that we can use that's portable and works on iOS, Android, Mac, Windows. And we've got fantastic documentation about how we can use that, how we can bring it into our projects and start working with that content. So let's start wiring up that to save our preferences for here's Here's the feeds that we're interested in. Now, I'm only going to save the one data type, the, the top-level news feed object of here's the feeds I'm interested in. I'll leave it up to you to be able to manage, well, here's the last time that I read content from there, or here's the content that I fetched. Save that so I don't have to go out to the Internet. I'm going to leave those 
little bits up to you to explore and figure out. I'm going to show you just the basics here of getting into that. Let me head back over to chat. I see a question coming in there. How you doing, Acid Necro? I, I saw you say hello there. Well, long time no see. I hope you're having a fantastic Friday. Um, you can do .NET Web APIs, no problem. But when I try to look into mobile development, I'm always struggling to port my knowledge to it. Is really both things that different? How can I make it easier for me? You could watch. You could watch amazing workshops like this one. Um, <laughs> I. This is where I think MVVM really helps me. And I also think the Blazor Web View approach helps me as well. Because then I can focus on building and doing those things with business logic that I'm familiar with and I know how to do from building APIs. I can focus on that and I can hand off the user interface to somebody who might be a little bit more skilled in XAML. Once we get past XAML and, and we start bringing in things like the MVVM framework, we're... We're, we know how to do that. That's that's your garden variety C sharp stuff. Learn how to do the observable capabilities and pass along the notifications and the event handling. We know how to do that as C sharp developers. Yeah, whether you're on Web API, Razor Pages, Win Forms, console applications, building uh, huge, massive Azure function applications, it's all the same. It's all the same. So. You've got some flexibility there. And right, for me as a web developer, being able to swap out the XAML with just a straight, here's the Blazor content and drop some HTML in there makes my job so much easier to think about and operate in. So I, I really like that. So um, that I think Blazor as Maui app is a fantastic on-ramp for web developers. And... And um, even, right, Blazor is even a little bit too specific. That We had somebody in chat a little bit earlier say, hey, I just took some static HTML and JavaScript for a simple web app that I was building, threw it in that dub dub root folder inside of a Blazor app, and within an hour, I was shipping an application to the iOS and Android stores. Like, yeah. Yeah, that's the goal, Right. The fact that the rest of the goo around it is .NET, who cares? Who cares? Um, certainly helps to know .NET. You can do a lot more things with that. But sure, that's great stuff. Oh my gosh. Friends, look who's here. Do, do, do you see who's here? I know who's here. He's right there. It's that Brady Gaster. Hello, my friends. So good to see you. Just logging into your PC after watching on the TV all morning. Are you kidding? You had this on the big screen TV? Uh, the echo effect? Well, wait do you see some of the other effects that we have here. <laughs> uh, Mad Titan mode and more. All right. It is... 